thank you for taking the time out and joining us for today's webinar, uh, which is being recorded. Um, this is the first in a series of, of protected webinars on the theme, safeguarding the student experience. Uh, these events are all related to specific aspects of the Protect Ed Code of Practice, with today's webinar uh, relating to Protect Ed Instrument 3, Student Harassment and Sexual Assault. Um, so some uh, housekeeping to begin with. Firstly, can you all please introduce yourself in the chat so people can get an idea who's attending today's event? Uh, and secondly, We'll be running a Q&A session with our speaker at the end of the webinar. So we've enabled the Q&A feature in Zoom. Uh, you'll see there's a Q&A button uh, with a couple of looks like speech bubbles at the bottom of the screen. Um, if you have any questions, please just type them into the Q&A window. Uh, please don't put your questions to our speaker in the chat window, thanks. So I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Caroline Davey, one of my fellow Protect Ed directors. Uh, and we're delighted this morning that Caroline will be interviewing Georgina Calvert-Lee, who is Head of UK Practice and Senior Counsel at international law firm McAllister Olivarius, uh, and also a member of the Protect Ed Advisory Board. In partnership with the research and lobbying organisation 1752 Group, Georgina recently published guidance on the handling of sexual misconduct complaints in UK higher education uh, and has many years experience giving advice and representing students on this issue. Caroline. Thank you very much. And thank you to you, G Georgina, for joining us this morning. Um, perhaps you could start by telling us a little bit about your work in the higher education sector. Yes, yeah, so I'm um, working, Michaelis Bonavarius has been working in the university space for a long time, um, originally in the US, so it did a lot of Title IX work and um, took forward some boundary pushing cases there. Uh, in the UK, we have been working with universities, often in the employment sphere, so we've been advising on discrimination and whistleblowing and um, contract disputes, promotion. Um, and advising at a senior level, but also at a junior level. And at some point, gosh, quite a few years ago now, that segued into quite a focus on sexual harassment. And again, at first it was um, staff on student sexual harassment. There was often, um, we found a difficulty in the relationship between a PhD student and their supervisor, because there is a very special dynamic of power that exists in academia, largely because of the great specialism that people go into. So when you, um, when you do a PhD in an area, there's often only a handful of posts or a handful of people globally that, um, that work in that area. And so if you get on the wrong side of someone, for instance, your supervisor, that can have a devastating impact on your ability to even break into that world. And so um, many PhD students we found seem to be simply falling out of academia, deciding it was just too difficult to complain or it was self-defeating. And so we became involved in many of those cases and also staff on staff sexual misconduct. And it's only more recently, and by that I mean, you know, three, four years, that we have seen the, the huge rise in student on student complaints and then subsequent complaints about how the university has handled those complaints. And so from what you said, it sounds as though the number of cases that you're seeing um, with regard to sexual uh, misconduct is actually increasing. Is, is that right? Or do you think it's just that you're getting more cases? I think it's increasing for various reasons. It doesn't mean that the prevalence of sexual misconduct is necessarily increasing. But I think um, the awareness of rights has increased with um, student tuition fees, perhaps, in the sense that uh, a student is a consumer. Um, a greater understanding that's come after the Me Too movement of, of what is sexual harassment, of what is grooming and sexual misconduct. Um, and, and then I think along with that, a greater awareness on the part of institutions of their own duty of care owed to students. Um, so five years ago, it was not unusual 
to hear universities saying well, duty of care to students? No, they could just about understand it to employees, but to students, that was, that was a barrier that we've had to cross. And I'm glad to say that now most universities and their administrators will freely admit they, have, they owe a duty of care to their students. And moving on to um, protected, our instrument number three, as you know, focuses on um, student harassment and sexual assault and was developed to, develop, uh, to address poor practice in the HE sector. In what ways do you think sexual misconduct cases are poorly dealt with by universities? I think there are some common themes that I see recurring and in a way that makes it sort of easier to deal with because you can drill down on what the problem is. And the problem, um, you can see how it's come about because um, it's almost a sort of well-meaning problem. So let me give you an example and that will illustrate it. Let's say someone makes a complaint of a very serious um, sexual harassment, maybe a rape on campus. and it actually seems to be a very credible. Not only is it serious, it's credible. And so the first thing a well-meaning administrator will want to do is implement a disciplinary process so that they can properly investigate. But then if they investigate and make a finding, uphold the finding, then have some, some sort of san sanction that they can impose. And that all makes sense. But the problem, there's a structural problem with doing that. Because if you take a complaint of sexual misconduct, and you immediately put it through to the disciplinary process because at the moment it is the disciplinary process which usually has the most sophisticated uh, protocols for carrying out investigations. So that's why for a serious credible complaint you'd want to put it there. Um, the problem with that is once you've done that, the complainant is essentially pushed out of the picture because the disciplinary process becomes almost like a quasi-criminal um, court process where the university sets itself up like the crown or the prosecuting authority against the person accused. And the person accused as an individual will naturally have many due process rights. That's only right. They should be able to see the evidence. They should have an opportunity to put their case to challenge the evidence. And that's all well and good. I mean, that's enshrined within our human rights law. But they forget that when a complainant makes a complaint of sexual misconduct, they're an individual too. And the first line of defense for many people accused of sexual misconduct is to discredit the person who made the complaint. And so they are essentially on trial too, but because they're not a party to the disciplinary process, they don't have any opportunity to see evidence put in against them to discredit them or to properly put forward their position. So that more often than not, the person accused will get off because the process is very much weighted towards their protections and no protections are given to the complainant. And the complainant is the only person who really has the ability to provide the evidence or sufficient evidence to ever overcome a, a sort of blanket denial defense. And what do you think are the barriers then holding back universities in terms of improving their practice in this area? I think the barriers are not for lack of well-intentioned people. I think the barriers are structural. It is because they have, for decades, um, developed disciplinary processes. Some are better than others. Some are extremely sophisticated. And that is the process in place. And so when an individual complaints manager is given a complaint, they just have to get on with it. And they have various time um, limits or deadlines within which they should progress a complaint. Absolutely, they should have those. But it's not part of their remit to say, hold on a moment, this whole process is not right because by using our disciplinary process, I am keeping the complainant out of the picture and therefore they don't have a right to see the evidence or attend a hearing or, or even see the outcome. So the problem is that the individual person dealing with the complaint is just getting on with the complaint in line with the processes in place now. But our, what we're saying, the 1752 group, the great advocates for this, and I've been helping them with it. It's the process that is wrong. The system has to change so that, so that the individual complaints manager can then be directed to the correct process that gives equal opportunities and rights to both individuals. As you know, um, the protected um, 
Code of Practice brings together a range of good practice recommendations in its student harassment and sexual assault instruments, including the UK's Changing the Culture Report and the Pinset uh, Mason's Guidance on Dealing with Student Misconduct. We were obviously very pleased to read your new guidance uh, published in partnership with the 1752 Group on addressing sexual misconduct in UK higher education. How did this collaboration between yourself and the 1752 Group come about? Well, it came about, I think, inevitably because we were two parties tackling the issue from slightly different um, perspectives, but we both saw a vacuum in the current system. And the UUK guidance and the Pinson Mason guidance had some great general principles, um, but essentially they're just saying, oh, handle it fairly. But they're not pointing out how universities can handle it fairly and the fact that universities' current systems are just not fair. So it's not good enough just to comply with your current systems, in our view. Um, we were, in fact, put uh, connected by um, a, a great advocate for reform, um, someone who's, who's had a personal interest and um, was fighting a personal battle for a reform of a particular institution. And um, she knew the 1752 group and she also knew us and we were, we were fighting cases on behalf of students and the 1752 group were busy lobbying for change. From, from a sort of student perspective, they had their own individual stories, having, um, having felt the system not work from the inside, as it were. Um, and why did you actually choose to focus your guidance on staff sexual misconduct? So, uh, for instance, to exclude, for example, student on student sexual misconduct? Yes, that was almost happenstance. That, that was the area of research that the 1752 group were focusing on um, at the time and it was their just particular interest but what we've come to see as time goes on that there are great similarities between the failures of processes to tackle student on student sexual misconduct that are very similar to those with staff student so we would want to give it a little bit more thought to see whether there are any tweaks that would be needed to apply to student on student, but largely the same principles should apply. And in my day job, when I'm representing students who have gone through a process which they feel has failed them, I'm um, urging the same sort of arguments as I am if it's staff on student sexual misconduct. So actually, they're not much different. And I think at some point we probably will um, just be able to check that there are no other special changes that would need to be made, but roll it out for, for all sexual misconduct within the higher education sector. I mean, perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about that, how you think that um, the guidance that you've got for staff misconduct would also then apply to incidents of uh, student on student harassment and sexual assault. Yes. Um, the reason I say they're similar is that um, the, when, when a student puts in a complaint of um, sexual assault or sexual harassment against another student, um, again, if it is a serious, incredible one, it will often be pushed through to the student disciplinary um, process, which is largely the same as the staff disciplinary process in that um, the complainant is, is sort of pushed out of the system and has no right to attend the hearing or to get the outcome. Um, there would always have to be, in, in all cases, I think there needs to be buy-in from the senior management level, first of all, because the changes we're suggesting um, are structural. And um, with student, student on student, it, you simply have to have the framework for, uh, for carrying out each of the steps. So you, you need to it's actually it's more complicated when it's staff on student because then you're trying to align a sort of an HR um, body that is uh, has a particular role with respect to employees with the student complaints body that has a role with respect to students. In some ways, when it's student on student, it's a bit more straightforward because you're likely to have just one body, the student complaints body, that's dealing with both students. Um, but I think it's given that each into institution is a bit different. It's hard to give a sort of blanket 
concrete advice on what they should do, but there needs to be a structural change to ensure that there is a central body within the university that is um, collecting data on, on complaints and also as a recipient for a complaint and ensuring that the process goes through consistently um, in each case. And um, your guidance, um, it emphasises the importance of students not being prevented uh, from discussing with others an incident of sexual misconduct or the impact that it's had on them. We're aware that there's a tendency for institutions to attempt to silence victims of sexual assault, um, often using non-disclosure agreements. Um, what are your views on non-disclosure agreements? Yes, I have a, a lot of views about non-disclosure agreements. It, it's a funny term to begin with, a non-disclosure agreement, because um, often, and perhaps more usually, what we see in universe, a non-disclosure agreement is essentially an agreement not to talk about something, not to disclose it. And um, it typically makes sense when you have a, a, a trade secret. Um, so in a commercial context, when you allow someone access to information, but only on condition they keep it secret. That's a typical non-disclosure agreement, and that's perfectly unobjectionable. Um, but non-disclosure agreements, or otherwise confidentiality clauses, have been imported into all sorts of agreements that have nothing to do with trade secrets, um, and often have a lot to do with an individual's own experience. And so it's an oddity that an institution, once told of someone's individual experience, might then try in an agreement, and the agreement may be, well, if you want us to do something to help you, like impose a no contact agreement with your alleged aggressor, then we will do that, but only on condition that you don't talk about it. And that's an oddity because what the university is then saying is not don't talk about a trade secret, you know, we're giving you a trade secret, but only on condition you don't talk about it. They're saying, well, you've told us about sexual misconduct, but actually if you want us to do anything about it, you can't talk about your own experience. And that's an oddity because the university has never owned that data. It's not, um, they don't have an ownership right in the information. And so for them to impose confidentiality upon it um, just seems wrong. It's wrong as a matter of contract law. I'm not sure it would be enforceable, but they almost don't need it to be legally enforceable for it to have a huge impact on the complainant because the complainant is often a student or even if they're a staff member, they're someone who has been um, subjected to sexual misconduct and it is in often a very vulnerable position and so if they're being told by the authority that they have turned to for help that will help you but you mustn't talk about it then that has a very powerful effect on making them keep quiet and the problem with making them keep quiet is sort of multifold um, mainly the problem is one of welfare that they then um, are not able or feel that they're not able to actually seek the support of a therapist even or of family members or even of a support group. Um, maybe they want to go to their academic mentor. I mean, I've, there, are many, uh, there are many very discreet victim survivors of sexual misconduct who don't want to go and publicize it necessarily. You know, I don't know if they want to, I have no, nothing against them doing that, but perhaps they don't, perhaps they just want to go to their academic mentor to say gosh this has happened to me what do you think I can should do I don't want to jeopardize my career but even doing that I have seemed to be held against them and they've then been subjected themselves to disciplinary measures for having dared say something that potentially brought the university into disrepute so um, I'm not a great advocate of NDAs I'm an advocate for not overusing NDAs and um, I'm aware I've given a sort of whistle stop, stop tour of my views because there are so many different aspects in which it comes on and I could speak for hours about that. Um, but on the flip side, sometimes they can be useful. Sometimes all parties uh, would come to get, would only come together if they're willing to come together, talk it through round the table or in some venue and then move on. And that can sometimes be better for some people. So I wouldn't say that you should always, you, that they should be uh, made unlawful, which you know is a perspective I have a lot of sympathy with. 
No, I see that sometimes they can be useful for everyone. Um, but often, often they're used just because people are too lazy to do otherwise, because they are so routinely used that you will get, um, you will get lawyers who say, oh, just use it because it's in our template. All the lawyers' templates include confidentiality agreements. And they'll say, well, just use it. And um, it's just easier that way. And we don't want to get in trouble with the um, Information Commissioner's Office. In the last few years, everyone has heard of GDPR and privacy rights. And there's a great fear that if you, well, there's a great confusion between imposing confidentiality and people's privacy rights. And sometimes the two are conflated. And so that's another reason why I think confidentiality clauses are overused across the board and including in the university sector. And do you see attitudes to them actually changing at the moment? You've said that they're overused, but do you see, I know that you um, have been in the public domain and putting your points of view, do you find that people are receptive to what you're saying? It comes in waves. Um, there was a great moment of light, I thought, after, um, I don't know if people remember Zelda Perkins' um, evidence to the Parliamentary Committee about feeling that she was forced into signing an NDA um, in relation to her employment um, with Harvey Weinstein. Um, after that, there was a lot of talk about NDAs then. And um, after that, it felt to me that there was a ground shift even amongst um, the legal profession. And that's important because it's lawyers who are usually advising their clients to use NDAs. It felt to me there was a groundswell of um, opinion against it. The Law Society put out a few um, guidance notes on their website for lawyers that they should not overuse NDAs. And there have, there have, been, there have been a couple of cases in which judges have pointed out that NDAs are not necessarily as enforceable as, um, as institutions think, would like to think they are. Uh, but they can be enforced sometimes, and so there's, there's still a tool if the right wording is used. Um, I feel that um, in the last year, so we've moved forward, to, um, you know, we've had a couple of years since the Me Too movement broke. I feel in the last year, the power of GDPR is trumping that um, sort of libertarian move to make things more transparent. And the great shame of GDPR is that it was a law brought in to protect the individual and their privacy rights against big organizations. But it's actually being used by big organizations as an excuse to shut everything up on the basis that, oh, we can't give you any information because that would feature everyone's rights. And so although you have a right to seek data on yourself, it's usually completely adapted apart from a few sentences. So it's a sort of useless right for seeking much information. Um, but it's also used as a, as a, a theme and a, an excuse really for, for saying, well, you may as well accept an NDA because everything is the private data of someone else, including your aggressor. And therefore that should trump your right to just talk, talk the truth, shine a light on um, things that have happened to you. We were pleased to see your support uh, for anonymous reporting in your guidance, um, something which Protected also requires. And we know that there are examples where technologies can be especially useful um, in supporting anonymous re um, reporting. And I'm thinking, for example, of the um, Callisto app. Could you talk a little bit more about why you think anonymous reporting is important? Yes, of course. Um, I, the Callisto app, I think, is a really... Um, a, it seems like a really great tool. I'm not sure. We've had conversations about whether we could use something like that in the UK, and I'm not sure we could with the EU rules on data protection. Um, I would like to think that we could, but I think we need to have more guidance from the Information Commissioner's Office before, before setting out on that um, route. But that, to be honest, the, the Callisto um, sort of collation of, of reports of sexual misconduct, which are then kept absolutely private unless or until someone else makes a similar report. 
um, touches on a theme, which let me expand on why I think it's important to have anonymous reporting. First of all, it's important to have anonymous reporting because often people find it very difficult to report. They are afraid they will be subjected to some form of retaliation if they do. They're afraid of victim blaming. They're afraid that there would be no point in reporting it because as we've just heard recently, the, the um, statistics on how often a report of rape ends up in a conviction and that's in the criminal system where the police have a lot of powers. Um, within a university, I can think the statistics on how often a report of serious sexual misconduct actually ends up in a finding are probably quite small. There's always going to be evidentiary difficulties, um, but that's not much consolation for the person involved who makes the complaint because they will think, well, why expose myself to the risk of being blamed as a victim? Um, having evidence brought against me, which produces my reputation, says that I'm making it up, um, says I'm promiscuous, you know, the usual things that are trotted out. So I think, why expose myself to that if the chances of actually having any sanctions imposed seem unlikely? It seems more likely than not that they won't be imposed. And so I think having an, an anonymous reporting system is really important for allowing survivors of sexual misconduct to make that first step towards taking back control of their lives and their experience. And so from a welfare perspective, I think it's very important. I think it's also very important for universities to be able to track and record trends of um, sexual misconduct. Now, they can't test how credible they are. They can't do anything about them. So it's limited the use they get. But nevertheless, they get some insight into what is going on on their campus. And so they can then um, sort of blindly, but nevertheless, sort of in a blanket way, go out and institutionally try to improve culture if they're getting a lot of reports. So both of those things are good. But the limit comes that what happens if you have a serious sexual predator on campus? It isn't that problem is not particularly helped, or any sexual predator on campus, you know, any, anyone who commits sexual misconduct on campus, what do you do with those people? Because they are not helped, or the, the institution cannot deal with that problem just by seeing anonymous complaints. In order to take any measure against someone accused of misconduct, you'd really need to have a complainant who's willing to put their name to the complaint. Um, or um, if they're not willing to put their name to the complaint, have multiple, um, be willing to give a name. Anyway, not to, not to simply describe a situation without putting any identifying data into it, because otherwise it can't be investigated. Um, that perpetrator can't be, um, can't be sanctioned in some way or, or, or tra whatever that sanction is, or trained or, um, the culture can't be improved and also other people on campus can't be protected from them. So I think an anonymous reporting system is very important as a stepping stone also to a formal complaint. I mean, can the uh, material that's um, collected on the anonymous reporting system then be used in the cases then later on? Well, we would like for them to be used. Well, ideally, um, an anonymous reporting tool can be a really useful investigative tool and the Callisto app is useful for that because what will sometimes happen is you will have a sexual misconduct perpetrator who will target one individual within each student cohort and those students don't necessarily know each other and so you may have um, 10 complaints about the same person over a period of 10 or 15 years. But no one at the university will know that unless there is some means of recording past complaints and keeping them on record, whether or not the person who made the complaint wants to put their name to it. Um, then you can imagine a situation where someone finally comes forward and they, they trigger the formal complaints process because they're willing to put their name to it. They want an outcome. And so a disciplinary process starts. 
Now, instead of starting and it seeming like there was just one complainant making a complaint against this one perpetrator, so it's very much a he says, she says situation. Instead of that, the investigator could look at um, the database, which would have to be kept in a very careful way and subject to lots of safeguards, but they would be able to look at the um, anonymous reporting database to see whether there have been any previous complaints against this person. Now, if the report has been anonymous, query how much use that is going to be, because um, there is some weight to having 20 anonymous people um, making a similar complaint about the same person. But the weight of that evidence is not nearly as strong as if that person can actually be identified and then subsequently um, referred back to and asked, well, do you, would you like to put in evidence now? You won't be alone now. There will be other people. Um, if you have 20 anonymous complaints, it, it can be used. But I say the weight of that is not so strong because if they're anonymous, you actually don't know whether it's not the same person putting in lots of different complaints. So there has to be some sort of safeguard also for the person accused. But it's still, although it wouldn't be a perfect system, it would still be better than having nothing to record. I would say both those complaints, which are not anonymous, but the complainant doesn't want to pursue them formally. It would still be very useful to keep that on record. And also where there are anonymous complaints, it would be nice if there could be a sort of twofold, um, there could be some way that the person who put in the complaint could be, could be tracked down. And I'm not sure that, that would be a technological thing that's beyond my um, understanding now. But that's the mystery we're trying to, um, we're trying to overcome is the one of a recidivist uh, perpetrator who just always slips through the cracks because there's only ever one complainant who's being a complaint at any one time and those historic complaints are just lost. One of the things that uh, we liked about Callisto um, was the fact that um, when a victim puts in their details um, that if somebody else, another victim names the same perpetrator then a counsellor reaches out to the victims. Um, and we particularly liked that because for um, a lot of victims, we know that it's a game changer for them to know that they are not the only victim of a particular perpetrator. And so that was one of the particular innovative aspects we thought of that particular technology. Um, but, it's, but it's also interesting, I think the technology um, to see actually how long it takes quite often for victims to actually um, even to put in um, data anonymously to a system, let alone report it to their um, institution or to friends, etc. So often, you know, cases are kept very quiet. That's, that's the problem. So. Yes, and it's important, therefore, I think, for universities to be open to historic complaints. Often people actually won't want to put in a complaint until they've graduated or until they've moved on to another institution. So those universities that do allow complaints with no time limit, obviously the longer it's left, the harder it's going to be to investigate. But I think that's absolutely essential Precisely because, as you say, it does take people a long time to come forward. And I agree with you. Another thing that we're very um, in favour of is this, um, the all around, the sort of surround support network. So bringing a complaint is just, it's just one tool. It's one tool to protect other people, protect, potentially protect yourself, help, help the survivor become empowered and take back control. But it's only one it's only one aspect of how you recover from sexual misconduct and how the university as a community recovers. Um, and counselling is really important. And sort of general training and awareness um, are all really, really important aspects. I note that your guidance uh, contains a section on the use of trained independent investigators. Um, what are the problems, or well, what are some of the problems with the ways in which universities currently carry out sexual misconduct investigations? Well, um, an investigation is a very complex, an investigation of a sexual misconduct complaint is a very complex 
thing to handle and to perform. Um, doing a fair investigation is a skill. I mean, the, the police are trained in that. Um, not everyone, it's not obvious that someone who is by day, say a biologist or, um, or a history professor will know how to um, carry out a fair investigation that is likely to um, deduce the best evidence or sorry, to produce, to adduce the best evidence. That's a skill, it's learned over years. And the idea, um, and, also it, and also it takes an enormous amount of time to, um, to start an investigation, to determine who might have relevant evidence, what other evidence there might be, what databases or social media accounts should be looked at, um, and then finding someone with the IT wherewithal to, um, to manipulate, manipulate in a good sense, you know, to, to use and um, look through that evidence and also to find the time and resources, i.e. a spare room um, and a place where you can interview people uh, and also a note taker, possibly a member of HR or of the student complaints office. Um, it is a major undertaking carrying out an investigation and then producing a report which um, requires someone to spend a great deal of time going through all of that evidence, picking out the relevant bits. There may be various different allegations, so picking out the various evidence from maybe 10, 15 um, witnesses, and then collating a report which might run to a huge number of pages, but which you're trying to keep short because it, often very important details get lost in large documents. But if everyone knows it takes a lot longer to produce a short report than a long report. Um, that's just stage one. Then that report goes to a decision maker and, the, and there may be a hearing um, and the decision makers um, and the decision makers give an outcome and then that may be appealed and then you need a different person to carry out the appeal. Now, um, what universities often do is ask, and I don't blame them because this is, they don't, they are not investigators by nature. They are universities, they educate and they do research. Um, but what they, they're sort of forced to do and what any employer is forced to do is to just find a manager, pluck them out of their day job and say, look, just get on with it, do this um, investigation oh, and by the way, you probably still have to do your day job at the same time. And yet there are time constraints. So it should be done within a certain um, period of time and the whole process, including um, reviews and appeals should be done within 90 days. Well, um, it, it's often just not feasible to do it within that time frame, And especially not if you're asking someone to do it while juggling a job, uh, their day job. And also without the special experience that does that you do need in order to put on um, a, a fair investigation that also understands the um, the balance of probability or the the standard of proof that that you're meant to be um, imposing or or assessing the evidence by. So um, you may have say a police investigator who. Um, is, is determined to look at the evidence or just pre framing um, looks at the evidence in a criminal fashion and is always looking to see that there's enough evidence to, to make sure that it's beyond reasonable doubt before they will think, well, the allegation I'll uphold, I will recommend that this goes forward to the next stage because it seems credible. Um, so it takes some training to understand that it's actually not a criminal standard that you should be looking for in a university setting but rather a civil standard of proof, which is a lesser one of balancing up what is more likely than not. But that's quite hard to assess, especially when you just have two pieces of evidence and they're diametrically opposed. You know, what do you do there? All of that is something that um, I think requires training and it requires time. And in your experience, do they exist, um, these trained independent investigators? Well, there are, there are organizations, I mean, there have been, there are commercial organizations um, set up to do precisely that. Um, and, you know, I don't, I, I've heard mixed messages, you know, from they can, they can be great 
and they can be not so good. I mean, I think like everything, it depends on, on the individual involved and also the client, the institution. You know, what terms of reference has the institution given to that investigator to allow them the latitude to properly investigate? To finish, um, I'm pleased to say that we'll be integrating your new guidance within Protect Ed Instrument 3 um, to encourage adoption of the good practice it contains by our member institutions. Can I ask whether you have any further thoughts on how universities might be encouraged to implement your guidance? Well, um, I think it's all about talking about it. Um, perhaps impressing on universities what they say um, by following this sort of guidance. Now, um, the reason that specifically McAllister Olivarius thought it's very important for universities to follow the 1752 guidance um, and why we did sort of put so much time into it is that through our legal cases, we're arguing that the way universities currently handle um, sexual misconduct complaints is often a form of indirect discrimination. And we think it's indirectly discriminatory because of um, the way the disciplinary process is so weighted towards the accused over the complainant. And in sexual misconduct cases, statistically, the complainant is most likely to be a woman and the accused a man. Now, that's absolutely not wholesale. It's not always the case. But statistically, it's much more prevalent in that way. And where you have a system that at the same time disadvantages this group, the complainant group, and the complainant group is more likely to be made up of women, then that can be seen as a form of sex discrimination. And so we are arguing these cases and we're putting them forward. Uh, we've issued some in court and um, they're getting resolved along the way. Um, but at some point there will be a court ruling and it will be decided. And then there will be a precedent, a very clear judicial precedent for universities to follow. Um, universities can wait for that if they prefer. We think that it's a sound argument, I and mean, we're not the only ones to think that. We're not, um, you know, we're not, we're not blazing a trail on our own. There are many discrimination lawyers that agree with us. Um, it will cost univer it costs universities a lot not to resolve the situation. It costs them a lot because at present, students can bring claims for um, for breach of the Equality Act. Uh, because of the way the complaints process is, I would say, not quite fit for purpose. Um, and it may be a breach of the university's duty of care towards their students by not having a system for handling sexual misconduct complaints, which is adequate for the complainant. And um, also reputationally, I mean, we all have heard of scandals of universities not responding well to complaints of cyber bullying, um, cyber racism, or sexual misconduct, um, and, you know, act not just online, but um, actual. And that costs universities hugely in terms of reputational damage, and that will impact their recruitment of top, top academics as well as the top students. So I think the costs are impossible to measure, but um, they're going to be very high from not complying. So typically as a lawyer, I'm talking about, you know, this is why you should do it, just protect yourself from all the bad things that will happen from not doing it. But also, universities are great institutions. We want our next generation of, of leaders and thinkers and artists to go through universities and have a wonderful experience. And that's where they learn to be adults and they learn to grow up and we want them therefore to be the best they can be. And so for that much more positive reason, um, universities ought to adopt the 1752 group um, guidance, or even if they don't adopt it sort of piece by piece, adopt the main principles that when you have two individuals to a procedure, they both have to be given equal rights. Um, if they do that, then I think universities will be a much better place anyone. Everyone will feel happier and more confident there. And everybody needs to have faith in the results, um, the, the accused as well, because the problem is yes. that people at the moment have a view that um, the system doesn't work. So 
even if somebody's acquitted, then they, they are not seen as having gone through a proper process and being able to say, no, I was found not guilty. That's, that's also, I think, difficult when things are not properly investigated. I, I completely agree. Um, and there are many people who, who feel let down um, on that side, you know, who, who have been accused and feel that they haven't had a proper time to air their, um, who, who actually have been um, pushed out of the university before any process. Um, and they've also been subjected to a, um, an NDA. Now, often that, that will protect them and will allow them to go on and get an, a better job. But, um, but it's problematic. I mean, I think transparency and justice is good for both parties, the accused and the complainant. Thank you very much, Georgina. I think we've got some questions. Did you want to field those questions, Andrew? Yes, thank you. Thanks very much, Georgina. That was excellent. Um, uh, I'm looking at the Q&A uh, box, which I think you can probably also see, Georgina. Um, I'll read it out just so that other uh, participants can hear it if they can't find it. Um, first question is from Emma Chapman, who I believe is from 1752. Um, introducing two users of a Callisto-like app could have great welfare benefits and give people strength to come forward formally, but might it introduce accusations of collusion or, or do you think that that's, this is an easy defence to dispel? Well, I think that that's a really great question. But I think the wonderful thing about the Callisto-like Callisto -like app, and I'm... Um, I'm not a great expert on it, so to do anyone put me right if I've got parts of it um, wrong, but my sense is that um, you put in a complaint, your own complaint, and then um, that stays essentially um, confidential and is not seen by anyone except, I suppose, the administrator. Then if subsequently someone else comes in and puts in a complaint and it's the same perpetrator, there's a, a sort of magical data correlation and it's flagged to someone. It sounds like a counsellor from what you were saying, Caroline, and then they're put together. Now, I think that sort of system actually might protect from accusations of collusion because in that situation, they are two absolutely independent people. They haven't been able to see the other complaint. And so the usual allegation that you jumped on the bandwagon couldn't wouldn't have any place because they've clearly come independently so i think actually on the contrary this is probably why you flagged it emma i think the callisto app would protect people from accusations of collusion yes i mean i think from what i understand one of the um nice things about the app is it, it holds the information in almost like electronic escrow so nobody mm -hmm. sees it except the system and the system doesn't introduce anybody to anybody without first asking the uh, reporter. So it will first of all ask the person who's made a complaint, will actually notify them that somebody else has made a complaint about the same person, would you like now to, so it gives you always gives the person the option of making the mm. contact. So, uh, which is which is quite nice, but it doesn't mean, it means no human being is actually involved in that, uh, apart from the original complainant in that process. Um, thank you. Um, the second, uh, oh no, we have, it's not a question, it was a comment from Catherine that is an excellent talk. I actually have a, a question for you, which was about, um, about the nature of uh, sexual misconduct. Are you seeing an increase in incidents of sexual misconduct that have a technological component, for example, online harassment, cyber stalking, uh, that sort of thing? And how do you think that sort of problem uh, might be addressed by universities? Yes, I am. I mean, this is not just in universities because um, there's a cyber component to people's relationships now. And, you know, and that's not, that's for better or worse, you know, in good, in, it's enhancing in many ways. I'm not against that. Um, but it does mean that a normal, normal everyday life involves also sort of social media communications. And often that has an evidentiary purpose, mainly, in that um, 
it can it can prove that something happened or or doesn't necessarily prove it but it makes it look very much more likely because you have a trail of documentary evidence um that is very hard to delete actually once it's out there so in some you may think you can get rid of a conversation but it can actually be found by some people um but it is then used i mean we all know of the warwick case where um where the university was being um held responsible for the actions of their students who were in what they would say is a private Facebook chat. And so they sort of say, well, what's that to do with us? Um, but actually it is something to do with universities because when you have students or employees um, working within your, under your umbrella, you do have a right as a university and they always do have codes of conduct. And it makes no sense for a code of conduct to only apply to half of a person's life. So, you know, we have a code of conduct. It's important when you're walking down this um, path, but not that path. We would all say that's ridiculous. Well, it's very similar. Why would you have a code of conduct that's important when you're sitting in a classroom and speaking to someone, but not when you're sitting in the classroom and just um, messaging them? You know, they're probably both in the classroom. I mean, that's what often happens. Um, and so I do think it's just part of life. So it's an extra dimension. Universities have to be cognizant of. They have to have codes of conduct that encompass it, because actually, I think it will be held um, in court. I think their duties of care will has the courts have recognised the role of social media, and so it won't help universities to say, "Oh, well, that's nothing to do with us," because actually, it is to do with them. Um, and while students are students then their life is going to be a little bit curtailed in that they have to abide by the code of conduct and that applies whether they're online or offline. Mm. Um, and there's really serious cyber bullying um, that goes on just in its own right. I mean, sometimes that is the seat of the actual, I mean, as in Warwick, that is the seat of the actual harassment. Mm. Um, and I think there, yeah, ultimately we need this sort of societal education. We're all relatively new as a society to social media and um, people just have to be educated on how you use it and being responsible. You will be responsible for how you use it. Thank you. And, and uh, one other thing, I mean, listening to your, uh, your discussion with Caroline, it, it, you talk a lot about the need for structural change within the universities. So is addressing incidents of sexual misconduct a university leadership issue? I think to begin with it is. Um, I think you need to have buy-in of the senior leadership team in order to affect the change to the disciplinary process. Now, um, in the sector guidance, we were very careful not to say not to be too prescriptive, not to say, look, here is um, A, B, C, D, a guide on how to do a good complaint process. We sort of wanted to do that. That was our intention when we set out. But we have been consulting with people in the sector. and It was very early on pointed out to us that um, higher education institutions come in all shapes and sizes. And it just may not be feasible in a small college to have the sort of, uh, to have, say, a standalone sexual misconduct um, process and tribunal. That won't make any sense. And in fact, everyone wants efficiency. And what universities do currently have now is often quite good disciplinary processes. And those are quite good for plagiarism, etc. So rather than sort of recreating the wheel and having, well, you can keep that for plagiarism, but let's have a totally different process for sexual misconduct. What I think might work well for many universities is simply tweaking the current sophisticated disciplinary process um, in ways suggested within the sector guidance. So in ways that formally acknowledge that the complainant is not just some sort of ad hoc witness who may sometimes be told the outcome, may not be, depending on the particular personality of the person um, advocating on behalf of the university, um, but rather will have a formal role, a right to, ed to evidence, a right 
Essentially, all the rights which are currently enshrined for the accused just add on and for the complainant. I mean, it, it actually doesn't take much to tweak the um, disciplinary process. But because these disciplinary processes have been around for a long time and through many administrations, it is going to take the authority of someone right at the top to say, um, I mean, the board of trustees would have to be involved, the vice chancellor, everyone right at the top will have to agree that we are going to make a change to our um, systems. Not, I wouldn't say it's even controversial. It's not a controversial change, but in big institutions, it's like you know turning around a tanker. It takes a long, long time. You have to get buy-in from many different stakeholders. Okay, thank you. And we've just had another question uh, added in from Lisa. Um, when university teams work separately, do you think there is a large chance that conflicting or duplicate investigations can take place? Uh, and what can this mean to the case? So I guess this is to do with silos between different support services within an institution. Yeah, that's a really good question. And um, that was actually one of the main reasons why we thought um, perhaps advocating for a standalone sexual misconduct investigation that was separate from the disciplinary process probably didn't make sense because um, what you want really is to integrate the processes so that you have only one investigation to have duplicate yeah. investigations is a recipe for disaster because you know no two individuals even when looking at evidence fairly will come quite to the same decision. I mean, things will be given slightly different weight. You hope that ultimately it would come to the same decision, but by a slightly different route and people can perceive that as unfair. So you do want to avoid having duplicate investigations, and but you therefore want to lead it all to lead to a place where you can have sanctions immediately imposed, not that you have an outcome after one investigation and then need to reinvestigate before you can impose sanctions. Thank you. Do you have anything else, Caroline? I don't. No, I don't. Well, thank you very much, Georgina. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, for your questions and for attending this uh, Protect Ed Reflections webinar. Uh, and again, thank you, Georgina, for being with us this morning mm -hmm. and sharing your knowledge and expertise. Um, the video recording uh, from this morning's session will be made available shortly. Um, it'll be available on the Protect Ed website on our YouTube channel and also on the McAllister Olivarius website. Our next Protect Ed Reflections event will be on Thursday the 27th of August at the same time at 11 o'clock uh, and details will be available on our events pages on our website shortly so please do save the date. Um, in the meantime um, thanks again for joining us, everybody. Stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thank you very much, and uh, goodbye. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Georgina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, really, really Thank you Caroline.